You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the Unsolved Colonial Parkway Murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Hi, welcome to Mind Over Murder. With our new episodes centering on the Route 29 stalker and other unsolved cases in Virginia, as well as our upcoming discussion with author Catherine Miles on her new book, Trailed, One Woman's Quest to Solve the Shenandoah Murders, we thought we might revisit a couple of episodes we did on the Alexis Murphy case. These were recorded in the early days of Mind Over Murder, and keep in mind that at the time we recorded these episodes, which will run as bonus episodes on Thursdays, Alexis Murphy's remains had not yet been recovered. We hope you enjoy these bonus episodes of Mind Over Murder, and as always, thanks for listening. Alexis Tierra Murphy was a rising senior at Nelson County High School. We know she was a volleyball star with an active social life and beloved by her family. She lived in the very small town of Shipman, Virginia. What was the population on that one, Bill? A 507, according to the 2010 census. We're talking a real small town in rural Virginia. Absolutely, just like a whistle stop. Shipman, Virginia, for those of you trying to place this on a map, is about 34 miles north of Lynchburg. She left her home to go to Lynchburg to go get hair extensions because she was going to have her senior portrait done. She stopped at the Liberty Gas Station in Lovingston, Virginia, which is about four miles from her home. That was the last time she was seen. This was August 3rd, 2013. Um, So she's seen on a gas station video stopping to gas up. She has a plan to head to Lynchburg, 34 miles away or so, to pick up hair extensions, senior portrait time, lots of concern about looking glamorous and that sort of thing. But this is planned to be a fun solo day trip. A nice way to kind of get out of the house and get away from the parents for a little bit. So she took her father's white 2003 Nissan Maxima and headed out just to have a day by herself to pick up her hair extensions and have a little bit of time driving around Southwest Virginia. It's a a fun place to drive. I've driven it a number of times. Now, we should mention something about the location of Lovingston. Bill, do you want to get into where it is precisely? Well, Lovingston is on Route 29, which is a, a, a... road that seems to show up over and over and over again. We're not implying that all these cases are related, but Route 29 has been connected to a number of disappearances and and murders, and there's even a case referred to as the Route 29 stalker case, which we'll talk about in future episodes. You really can't help but look at a, a list of missing persons cases uh, throughout Virginia and notice that continuity of Route 29 continuing to come up over and over and over again. So as Bill mentioned, we are going to cover the various cases that have happened along Route 29 as we continue here. Alexis pulled into the gas station at Lovingston. The last images that we have of her were on the surveillance footage in the gas station, talking to a man who would later be identified as the man that police suspected eventually murdered her. Now, the interaction that we see on the video, there's no sound appears to be just pretty routine. He holds the door for her and they appear to engage in some sort of short conversation. Randy Taylor was known at that particular gas station as kind of a creeper. Yeah, that's an understatement. He was known to hang out in that parking lot for hours in his camouflage uh, Chevy Suburban, just ogling the teenage girls who hung out in the parking lot. If you if you want prime creeper behavior that that is it for sure at least in my book no i'd have to agree and his uh, apparently his 
pickup truck with the camouflage paint job was very distinctive. So a lot of people in town knew him and knew the truck and had witnessed this behavior of him sitting there staring at the girls in the parking lot. And if you're doing that for hours and hours every day, certainly someone is going to notice Certainly someone is going to be situationally aware enough to notice this guy has been hanging out here every single day looking at the teenage girls. And this was a hangout for local teenagers. I mean, Lovingston is kind of a blip on the radar. And if you have nowhere else to hang out, the parking lot of the gas station is where you're going to do it. Yeah, no disrespect to either small town, but Lovingston's a pretty small town as well. And so this behavior was noted. He did, as you mentioned, he held the door open for her when she entered the gas station. When she left a couple of minutes later after presumably paying for her gas, the surveillance video caught her approaching his Suburban and having a conversation with him through the window. We don't know what was said, but we do know that when he pulled out a couple of minutes later and headed north, Alexis got into her car and pulled out after him in the same direction. Yeah, so the expression asked and offered comes to mind. Clearly, they had some sort of what appears to be a pleasant enough interaction without sound. And the two vehicles leave one, two, a short while later. And so she appeared to be following him out of the parking lot. We only have a guess as to what actually happened between the two of them. We'll get into that in just a couple of minutes. But uh, when Alexis did not return home that night, her family grew incredibly worried. Uh, And when she did not make her midnight curfew, her family called the police and reported her missing. And they grew even more concerned several days later when her car was recovered in the parking lot of a Carmike Cinema in Charlottesville, which, again, for anybody who doesn't know Virginia, is 35 miles to the north of the gas station. In other words, in the wrong direction. So she's supposed to be headed south to Lynchburg. The car is found completely in the opposite direction in Charlottesville, which is obviously a significantly larger city. It's probably also worth noting that because Alexis was 17 and still a minor, the FBI was involved right from the get-go. If there's any potential of a kidnapping or crimes against a minor, someone less than 18 years old, the local authorities and the Virginia State Police had the option to call in the FBI, and they did in this example. So there was quite a team of law enforcement working on her missing persons case right from the start. Which really we can only be thankful for because they, they did do an excellent job in this case. So after her car is recovered, four days elapsed, and at that point, the police announced that they were trying to ID photos of the people seen in close proximity to Alexis at the gas station prior to her disappearance, and that ultimately read, uh, led them to Randy Taylor. It's probably worth noting here, because we've talked about this, in cases like the Colonial Parkway murders and other cases that go back decades, um, when I go out and speak to schools and universities about the case, people will often say, well, isn't there surveillance video? And this phenomenon of kind of cameras everywhere, and I know civil liberties folks and some other people are not completely comfortable with this. You know, mostly it's about recording in case of a robbery or something like that. In other words, designed as a security footage for the gas station in the convenience store that was part of the station. The truth is they actually have great benefit when something like this comes along because this actually presented one of the most significant early breaks in this case was reviewing the videotape surveillance. That did lead police to Randy Taylor. And, you know, Randy Taylor, aside from ogling girls in the parking lot of the convenience store, which is creepy enough. But not necessarily illegal. Exactly. Yes, exactly. It's not. We're, we're not saying that that's illegal. We're just saying, please don't do that because it's gross. Um, it might have been different. You know, if you're 17 and they're 17 and you're hanging out with your friends in the parking lot, as long as you're not saying or doing anything rude, watching your ears come and go probably isn't quite as creepy as a 48 year old man with an extensive criminal background. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not defending teenage boys. I, I, think, I think I was one um, several, several years ago. Several decades ago. Several, I think you mean, Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> decades ago. <laughs> Randy Taylor has quite the past, shall we say. Uh, his criminal record goes back at least two decades. Uh, so this is a guy who is, he is no stranger to law enforcement. After taking a look at uh, 
at some of the evidence that was recovered from Randy Taylor's trailer. I, I think you can come to a pretty solid conclusion that Randy Taylor had just about everything to do with Alexis's disappearance. You want to talk about some of that evidence, Bill? Well, and, and one thing I'll, I'll add as an observation, I remember following this case when it happened in 2003, and I remember when they announced that they had found evidence at his camper, looking on at Google Maps, he's very close by the gas station. From the, the evidence that was found, hair evidence, a fingernail, which was clearly belonging to Alexis, and a bloody shirt, which matched what she was wearing at the time of her disappearance. Which we know because of that surveillance uh, video from the gas station. Now, she wasn't there, but there was a significant amount of physical evidence. And of course, after being tested by the FBI uh, for DNA evidence, it was confirmed that all of these things belonged to Alexis. After a second search, they did find that bloody shirt. They found bloody hair extensions. They found part of a false eyelash and they found a diamond stud earring. Clearly something very bad happened in that trailer. They also found her iPhone. And where was that iPhone? The iPhone was nearby. I remember seeing pictures at the time. It was smashed and thrown down an embankment, but not far at all from where his trailer was located. There was a significant amount of of physical evidence tying her to that location. But her body was never recovered. It has yet to be recovered. And Randy Taylor has refused to give any information regarding the whereabouts of Alexis Murphy's body. He did attempt to trade such information at a later date. We'll touch on that in a minute. Randy Taylor was ultimately arrested and was indicted on two felony charges of first-degree murder, first-degree felony murder, abduction with intent to defile, and because he just seems to be a guy who can't stay out of trouble, an unrelated grand larceny charge as well. There was some physical evidence found in a search of a nearby river where dive teams and canine units searched, and they found a red sweater, but it turned out not to belong to her, and that they ended up just putting that evidence aside. Um, There was some speculation at the time that it belonged to her, but it turned out to be unconnected to the case. Alexis is, that doesn't sound right, but I'm going to go with it. I'm the English teacher. I know it's right. It just doesn't sound right. (laughs) I feel like there's a lot of S's there. (laughs) There there are a lot of them. Alexis, oh, that's terrible. Her case is not the first. We could say Ms. Murphy, but even she would probably correct us. Sure. Her case is is not the first uh, what's called a no body murder trial in the state of Virginia. Some people said at the time that it was, but our research has turned up other cases that also involve so-called no-body homicides. So so there was some incorrect reporting at the time in 2013 that this was a first, and as it turns out, that's not the case. It is rare for prosecutors to seek a a life, you know, life sentences as they did in this example with no body, but with the advent of uh, forensics just, you know, moving forward by leaps and bounds, And they had so much physical evidence, plus the video, tying Randy Taylor to Alexis. There wasn't much defense in terms of claiming that Alexis Murphy wasn't at the gas station and didn't follow him to his trailer. The the preponderance of evidence, both circumstantial and physical, was so strong that uh, the prosecutors really felt, we have a slam dunk case here. We're just going to go ahead and go for it. You sound like law and order now. (laughs) Uh, Well, I I watch way too much of it and CSI and Criminal (laughs) Minds and everything else. So I I guess some of it was bound to rub off at some point. We are going to talk about the the first nobody murder trial in the state of Virginia in another episode. Uh, But for those of you that are are so intensely curious, you just can't stand it until we get there. The uh, case that we are referencing is that of Gina Renee Hall from 1980. She was murdered by Stephen Epperly, a Virginia Tech student. To this day, her body has not been recovered either, but we will be covering that in a future episode. So moving on to Randy Taylor's trial, it it happened, you know, sort of fairly quickly. The, The wheels of the criminal justice system are not always fast moving. This actually happened, you know, fairly quickly. About a a year later, Randy Taylor's trial began, and it was on May 4th, 2014. And I would say, as expected, he pled not guilty. 
Which is his right. It would, yes, absolutely. He did say, yes, Alexis had been in his trailer, but he said she was there with another man. He named that person as Damien Brown and asserted that Alexis and Damien had arrived together to buy marijuana. He said they had had a couple of beers with him and then they left together. And Damien Brown is a pretty distinctive guy from a physical perspective and is also driving a pretty distinctive vehicle. So tell us sort of what this guy looks like and what he's driving. So Damien Brown has uh, his cornrows in his hair and he was driving a, let me check my notes here to make sure I get it completely and totally right. I remember seeing pictures of the car. He was driving a burgundy Chevy Caprice with 22 inch rims. So here's a young African-American guy with cornrows. So pretty distinctive hairstyle driving a burgundy full-size Chevy with 22 inch rims. Both the gentleman and the vehicle would be hard to miss. And the reason that we're mentioning this is uh, going to come to focus a little bit later when we talk about other potential suspects in this case that Randy Taylor brought up a couple of years later. So, uh, you know, hold hold on to that thought, put a pin in it. Uh, We're going to come right back to it in just a few minutes. You mentioned a speedy trial. From my perspective, I followed this case pretty closely and I'd had uh, some contact with some of the family members, you know, expressing support and that kind of thing. So this crime happens in August, 2013. He's on trial for murder by the following May. Yeah. That's real fast. It really, really is. And those of us that are following other cases, I mean, Golden State Killer case, Joseph D'Angelo. Oh, man. We're probably going to be years before he's actually in a courtroom taking the first steps towards trial. These cases can stretch on for years. This one um, happily did not. The The Canal Killer case in Phoenix that I've been following, it feels like it's never going to go to trial. So yeah, th- this is this is very quick. The the criminal justice system certainly, uh, you know, worked toward that that speedy trial. Authorities did ultimately follow up with Damian Brown, and they very quickly determined that he had a solid alibi, uh, and he even went so far as to assert that he had never even met Randy Taylor before, and would have had no reason to be in his trailer and to be around a lake. Now, Randy Taylor had had to have some awareness of of Mr. Brown. Uh, he didn't just pick the name out of the out of the air, but he must have had some idea that who this guy was. We're not 100% certain what the connection is. We believe he was trying to obscure, Taylor was trying to obscure his involvement by dragging this other man in. And then yeah. he ended up taking that further when uh, he moved into uh, his trial and appeal. The preponderance of evidence against... There you go again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> English teacher. Too much CSI. <laughs> <laughs> Too much law and order. You can take your pick. Put all three together and <laughs> this is what you get. Yeah, yeah. All of that evidence caused the jury to very quickly find him guilty on all charges on May 8th. Yeah, so in a week, he's found guilty. Again, those of you that follow courtroom TV and you know that kind of thing, court TV, usually these things stretch on for weeks, if not months, and they're in and out in a week. In his appeal, Randy Taylor did argue that he had uh, ineffective assistance of counsel because his lawyer, Michael Hallahan, did only take a very, very short amount of time to present his evidence. Well, uh, he rested his defense after only one hour. Which is like no defense at all. And (laughs) and again, everyone is entitled to a vigorous uh, defense. And in the meantime, the prosecutors put forward 40 different witnesses. Mm-hmm. 40 witnesses across a couple of days. And that, that was thanks to Commonwealth's attorney, Anthony Martin, who did such an excellent job. And I think we, we're using the term buried under a mountain of evidence. Yeah. And that seems to be about right in this case. At any rate, he was convicted and... The jury only took eight hours, and this would have been in a complicated case. I think the Commonwealth attorney had done an outstanding job of presenting the evidence, and uh, the the jury seemed to absorb the entire thing, and in less than a day, were ready to move forward with a guilty verdict in front of uh, Judge Michael Gamble. Uh, Randy Taylor was sentenced to two life sentences on July 23rd, 2014, when he reached this phase of the trial. He attempted to bargain for a lesser sentence. He said a third party had been involved with the crime. That was not publicly disclosed the name of that third party. 
but he did promise to reveal the location of her body in exchange for a 20-year sentence. And ultimately, that deal was not accepted. Bill, you want to talk about that deal for a little bit? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons to turn that deal down. First of all, you know, as the brother of a murder victim, you know, I'd be outraged if something like that were to happen. And sure. hopefully someday we'll face our sister's killer in, in court and have that opportunity. I think with a high-profile case like this, and there'd been a tremendous amount of community support, I mean, an explosion of people who were trying to help the Murphy family find their missing daughter, the Harrington family connected with the Murphy family. This is Morgan Harrington's parents. There was a great deal of support. I think to have a pretty slam dunk case against Randy Taylor, even in the no body situation, and then to have Taylor try to trade knowledge of where her remains might be found for 20 years, I don't think that would have been a smart uh, maneuver for the prosecution. Down the road, once Randy Taylor is facing life in prison and two life sentences, you know, he's never getting out of jail. This is the part I struggle with. You would like to think that someone who has now realized they're going to spend the rest of their life in jail would be willing to tell investigators and the family where they might find the remains of their lost loved one. I think I'm applying a standard as if a killer like this has a conscience and would have the, the morality, if you will. I mean, I'll be a bit judgmental here to say, you know, I can do something good for these people to maybe help ameliorate some of the damage that I've done to this family. But I don't think that occurs to most people in this brutal potential serial killer category. It could be a power and control thing. This is my my minor, minor knowledge of profiling and psychology yeah, coming yeah, into yeah. play here. It may be, uh, you know, a power thing that is the only thing that he has left to use as leverage. Maybe he gets a sense of satisfaction from holding that back. Uh, I do not know. I do not have a degree in in, uh, in psychology or profiling, but that's the, the thing that tends to stick in my mind. It seems to be my, my hypothesis. And I struggle with this one because I, I just think doing the right thing is not part of the vocabulary for someone as cold-blooded as someone like Randy Taylor. No, certainly not. Even though there's such limited upside to him withholding this information for whatever reason he has chosen to. I know the family has has told me privately that they hope that at some point Randy Taylor might need or want something sure. you know, in his incarceration and that they might be able to leverage, there's that word again, his desire for something, whatever it is, better treatment, a different jail. I don't know. It's a limited menu of options available to someone who's serving two life sentences. Something, excuse me, that would give law enforcement an opportunity to revisit the question of where can Alexis' body be found all these years later. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. And they have continued to look for her, as well as another missing teenage girl, Samantha Clark, who we're going to talk about in a later episode. They've continued this search, so certainly they are not giving up on trying to find her remains. There's even an investigator who is attempting to find Gina Renee Hall's remains, even though her case is, you know, nearing the the 40-year mark. So, you know, you, you really just have to tip your hat to these investigators who really want to continue to do justice to the families in finding their loved ones' remains. I, I think that's wonderful. They can only be praised for that. Now, they've searched uh, one location we know of at least twice looking for remains, and that's a, a hunt club that Randy Taylor had access to and some history with. Now, here's a guy who is driving this, you know, really high ground clearance four-wheel drive vehicle, and he's, uh, you know, an outdoorsman. And so this vehicle is capable of going lots of different places and down dirt roads and that kind of thing. But they have searched one site twice, you know, even using cadaver dogs and dive teams, which we know they've used. It's still really difficult unless you have an indication of where in this large tract of land you should be uh, looking. This is a, an area with a lot of woods, very rural. There's farms and fields and lots of opportunities to hide a body or bodies. Without some direction from Taylor, it's going to be very difficult 
truly a needle in a haystack type of search versus something where if he were to indicate, you know, you should be looking along this road or at the hunt club in this corner of the however many acres the property might be. 200. It's 200 acres. It's a lot of property. Probably surrounded by other fields and forests. And there's a great deal of open land in that part of, of Virginia. Very pretty, but isolated. In 2014, Randy Taylor was not done with the uh, the court system. He did decide to appeal his two life sentences. Again, his bill has said before that is his right to do so. He brought up two main points. The first one we've touched on already. He said he felt he received ineffective assistance of counsel from his attorney, Matthew Hallahan. He may have a point there, actually. An one hour defense versus <laughs> 40 people called by the prosecution. That's almost like no defense at all. And again, I'm not saying that there's this crime is defensible, but you'd think he would have thrown up a little bit more than an hour's worth of effort. Now, he also brought up a second point. He said he felt that the case should have been moved outside of Nelson County in order for him to get a fair trial. He is quoted as saying, there's too much love toward the family, which is fine, but there's just too much bias to be held here. I'm not sure why the first attorney wasn't bringing some of these issues up at before trial. In other words, the desire to move to perhaps another county in Virginia certainly could have been put forward at an earlier point. I, I think this is a case of, of the new attorneys working on the appeal saying, let's sure. just keep throwing up different arguments and see if anything sticks. And then came 2016 and the arrest of a serial killer who I'm sure most of you have heard of before, and that is Jesse Matthew. After Jesse Matthew's October 2014 arrest, Randy Taylor's lawyers asked for the DNA evidence in Randy Taylor's case to be tested against Jesse Matthews' DNA, presumably to determine whether there was a match between the two of them. Was Jesse Matthews somehow involved in Alexis Murphy's disappearance? Bill, you want to comment on that? That, Well, they were trying to tie in Jesse Matthew into the Alexis Murphy case. They were already investigating Matthew, no S at the end of the name, for the disappearance of Morgan Harrington as well as Hannah Graham, two young college students we'll talk about in a future episode. Many people here in Virginia are very cognizant of those two tragic cases. The attorneys made this, uh, for Taylor, made this very odd decision to, I would call it kind of a Hail Mary pass Mm -hmm. on the outside, outside chance that Jesse Matthew was somehow involved in the disappearance of Alexis Murphy. On the surface, there are some similarities, but it seems like wishful thinking on the part of his legal team for Taylor's attorneys to say, we want to have DNA tests done on Jesse Matthew. They did move forward to eliminate Jesse Matthew as a suspect in Alexis Murphy's disappearance. They also asked for there to be an analysis done of Alexis Murphy's social media accounts to determine whether or not she had had any contact with Jesse Matthew on social media. Of course, that did not come up either. And as we've talked about in previous episodes, you know, we live in a different world now. Here's a a bright, young, 17-year-old rising senior who was very active and, you know, had her cell phone with her at all times. Certainly, they were looking to see if Matthew and Alexis' paths had ever crossed from a social perspective. And of course, remember, kids, the internet is forever. Yes, (laughs) It, it definitely is. They ultimately determined, no, there had been no contact between Jesse Matthew and Alexis Murphy. And, you know, even after that, there was still a ton of speculation in the public and, of course, on the Internet, where we know Internet sleuths love to live and speculate and discuss ad nauseum. We have our Facebook page on our case. We know there was continued speculation that probably Jesse Matthew was somehow involved with Alexis Murphy. And that, unfortunately, that speculation continues. And it's funny, the the Commonwealth attorney had said they were not aware of any links. And believe me, this would have been something they would have explored because obviously there was the possibility until a suspect was identified that there could be a link between these cases. What I'm baffled by is people's ongoing insistence that somehow these cases are all related. I think people become fascinated by serial killers and potential links between cases. And certainly, you know, 
I've enjoyed going down that rabbit hole myself once or twice, maybe more than twice. But <laughs> but in this example, they really did take a look at it. And there was a bit of an eye roll, I think, from the on the part of the prosecution because they had already looked at this sort of thing. But they went ahead and met the attorney's request and ran the tests. And they did not find anything First of all, in terms of the DNA and forensic evidence, as well as the review of all of the electronic communication between Alexis and anyone that she was in contact with on social media. Given the amount of disappearances and murders along Route 29, I can understand the impulse of people to want to connect them because it is a nice, easy answer that would it would tie up all the loose ends so well. But unfortunately, real life is messier than that. As much as we don't want to think about the fact that there may be multiple people preying on young women along Route 29, it seems more than possible that that is precisely what has happened. They have not been able to link Alexis Murphy to Jesse Matthew. And as well, Samantha Clark was ruled out as being linked to Jesse Matthew in any definitive way. She was, however, linked to Randy Taylor. In fact, they had spoken on the phone a number of times before Samantha disappeared. So as frightening and upsetting as it may seem to think about, it is entirely possible that there were two serial killers prowling the Route 29 area, Jesse Matthew. We know he's responsible for Morgan Harrington and Hannah Graham's death. And Randy Taylor, responsible for Alexis Murphy and quite possibly for Samantha Clark. And since we're on the subject, let's go ahead and turn to Samantha Clark very quickly. So there was ample public speculation, even after police had cleared Jesse Matthew of being involved with Alexis Murphy, uh, asserting that, well, okay, we know that they said that they cleared him, but really he must have had something to do with it. A CBS News 6 reporter published a piece very pointedly titled, The Five Things People Get Wrong About Alexis Murphy and Jesse Matthew, probably hoping to clear up some misconceptions there. And probably tired of answering the same questions and speculation over and over again. Here are, in no particular order, the five things that people get wrong about Alexis Murphy and Jesse Matthew. And hopefully this will clear up a little bit of those uh, misconceptions that people have. And we've already mentioned that Taylor attempted to implicate another man, Damian Brown, in Alexis Murphy's disappearance. And this reporter takes a few minutes to say, hey, they cleared that guy. And that guy was not Jesse Matthew. He later goes on to say that guy that they cleared does not look like Matthew, as people probably want you to think. He had cornrows. Jesse Matthew had dreads. He also clarified the question of the cars that both men were driving. Damien Brown had, as we mentioned before, a burgundy Chevy Caprice with those 22-inch rims. Jesse Matthew drove a burnt orange Chrysler Coupe. Not likely to get these two cars confused. Well, you're, you're the car guy, not me, so I'm, I'm going to assume you know what you're talking about. <laughs> there was also some confusion regarding the surveillance footage about the gas station. The surveillance video showed Alexis Murphy walking near an orange object. And many people have asserted that orange object, probably Jesse Matthews' coupe. I remember seeing a lot of this stuff online at the yeah. time. And Seems people were familiar. insisting that the orange blob in the background of, of one of these shots had to be Jesse Matthews' vehicle. And just to make sure that there was no misunderstanding on this part, the FBI actually went back through and looked at the surveillance footage a second time and they said, look, we can clearly definitively state that that orange blob, it's not a car, that's a sliver of a sign from the gas station window, it's not a car. I remember this. People were so insistent about this that, you know, I don't know if to humor people is exactly what I mean, but they said, okay, in the interest of being thorough and transparent we're going to go back and take a look at this and apparently it was something that was fuzzy and in the i think in the foreground in the foreground yeah yeah and it was the lettering from a sign i think in the window Mm -hmm. of the convenience store which is part of the gas station and then the final uh the final thing in this list of five things people get wrong about alexis murphy and jesse matthew is the reporter's reminder that there was a mountain of physical evidence showing that Alexis Murphy had been in Taylor's camper. 
It definitively places her there. There is no such evidence linking Jesse Matthew to Alexis's car. And in fact, they went back through, investigators went back through and said, okay, we're going to go ahead and swab the seat of her car. We're just going to go through again one more time and make sure that we haven't missed anything. The DNA that they pulled from Alexis's car was not that of Jesse Matthew. Now, one detail that hops out for me, and I've never been completely satisfied in terms of understanding how how this could have worked. Randy Taylor, it appears, moved Alexis' father's car, the white Nissan Maxima, 35 miles or so in the wrong direction up to Charlottesville, and he parked it at this movie theater parking lot. What I've never been able to figure out, and other people have asked this question as well, is it is difficult for a person to drive 35 miles, in this case north, from the gas station or his house, uh, which is quite nearby. The question has always been, how did he get back home? And I've seen a lot of different speculation. Did he walk? You know, 35 miles is a long walk. Yeah, probably not. Did he hitchhike? Did he use a tow truck? Now, Randy Taylor has a background in automotive repair and had worked for a repo shop and might have had access to tow truck and or vehicles like that. It's a possibility. There's also the perhaps more likely possibility that he might have had an accomplice who gave him a ride. But that could be explained away with something as simple as he just called somebody and said, hey, I need a favor here. I'm dropping off a vehicle up in Charlottesville. Can you give me a ride. Now, that person has never come forward to our knowledge. There is that unexplained, how does one guy get a vehicle up to Charlottesville, drop off the car, and then get back home sure. to the location where his his truck can be found? There is that gap, and it's a bit unexplained. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, unless Randy Taylor is willing to talk, which he has never shown any any willingness to do, I don't think we're ever going to know for sure. And he's currently, last time we checked, tucked away in a supermax prison in Pound, Virginia, at the opposite end of the state. Uh, It's a state supermax, and it is right on that border between Virginia and Kentucky. So it is tucked way, way away. Speaking of Randy Taylor, he's also a suspect in the disappearance of Samantha Clark. Samantha Clark was a 19-year-old young woman. She disappeared September 13th, 2010. She lived in Orange, Virginia, which is a little bit bigger town, population 4,721 in the 2010 census. Just think we'll have updates on the census soon. (laughs) And Orange, Virginia is a small, is a pretty small town, 28 miles north of Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, it's fairly close to Route 29, not directly on Route 29, but not far from it. Now, the evening that she went missing... Samantha was watching TV and her younger brother Hunter, who at that time was 12 years old, said that she had called downstairs. She was upstairs in her bedroom wearing her pajamas and she called down and said she was going out. So when her mom looked in her room later, she saw that she had tossed her pajamas onto her bed. So obviously she changed her clothes back into street clothes and headed out. She didn't provide any explanation to Hunter where she was going. You know, mom said that it was very unusual for her to leave the house after dark, that she didn't even like to go into the yard by herself after dark. You know, I wonder what could have prompted this young lady to decide that she's leaving in the middle of the night when normally this is completely out of her comfort zone. Mom was working and and she was home alone with her younger brother, who's at 12 is probably old enough to be left alone. But Samantha, by all accounts, was kind of a slow starter. She was a high school grad, but she hadn't quite decided what she wanted to do Mm -hmm. yet at age 19. She didn't yet have a driver's license. And from my perspective, having grown up in the suburbs up in Massachusetts, getting your license was a real rite of passage, particularly if you lived away from a major city. I mean, later in my career, I lived in Boston and New York and Philadelphia and then Los Angeles. And, you know, you don't need a driver's license in a lot of those places because you hop on public transportation or these days take Uber or Lyft and you can get where you want to go as a young person or young professional. In a place like Orange, you'd probably need a driver's license. And I find it a little striking that she hadn't gotten around yet to getting a driver's license. 
Yeah, no, definitely. And, and, you know, mom had mentioned in one of the articles that we were reading that there is no public transportation in Orange. There is no way to get around. So if you need to go from place to place, you got to have your license. Which does sort of beg the question, if she did leave, who did she leave with? Right. In other words, someone's got to be picking her up if they're going somewhere, if it's not, you know, on her block, which may steer us towards Randy Taylor or another friend. After she went missing, now keep in mind, Samantha's 19, so she's above 18 is what I'm saying. She's not a minor. Her mom, after getting home from work, wanted to report her missing, and she was told by law enforcement that she could not report her missing for 48 hours. I think a lot of localities have changed these laws because there are situations like this one where there's just something so odd about someone's disappearance from the scene that probably warrant early involvement from law enforcement. She was told she couldn't even report Samantha because she was over 18, missing for 48 hours. And then later, Very frustratingly, she said, uh, her mother was told, oh, that was a mistake, that she could have reported her missing. Oh, wow. As we know, you know, when you're looking for someone, you want to be looking as early as possible before the trail goes cold. It was a very unfortunate uh, misunderstanding. Randy Taylor's name came up very early on as a potential suspect. Her mother reported that she had met a group of new people, which included Randy Taylor, and they apparently had some mutual friends. Now, one thing I find very odd, Randy Taylor's 48 years old. Samantha Clark is a 19-year-old young woman. There's nearly a 30-year age difference between Randy Taylor and Samantha Clark, but supposedly they had friends in common and were seen socializing at a pub. And Randy Taylor then was considered a suspect since day one. That's a direct quote from law enforcement. Turned out that he had called Samantha's house six times on the night of her disappearance. So certainly he was on police radar from that moment on. I can't think of any good reason to call someone six times unless you were looking to invite them someplace, take them somewhere, something along those lines. So certainly he was on on that radar, even though he has not been charged in her case. You know, law enforcement has never said that they have a better suspect than Randy Taylor. No, I, I think he's also supposed to be the last person who actually spoke with her the night she disappeared. And then we have the six attempts to reach her, which strikes me as completely over the top. Mm -hmm. Apparently there was some argument at the bar where they were seeing some minor jealousy situation, but I I don't know exactly how Randy Taylor could have inserted himself into Samantha Clark's life, but apparently he did or he attempted to. And so there's this very aggressive follow-up on his part to connect with her. He did speak with her several times. They had checked her cell phone records. And then of course he makes these six attempts to reach her at home which everybody found very striking. Once again, Samantha Clark disappeared from Orange, Virginia and has never been found. Now, she went missing September 13th, 2010. In the several years after that, they continued to search the area. Again, we're talking about a very beautiful rural area with a lot of woods and fields, lots of opportunities to hide a body. They once again search this uh, land in Ehart, Virginia, E H E A R T. Mm-hmm. So the letter E followed by heart. I'm going with my gut on the yeah, I, <laughs> pronunciation. The I, I've honestly never heard of it before. It's in, uh, it's in Orange County. And that's the, the land that we mentioned earlier. That's the hunt club. The 200 acre private hunting club. Yeah, right. yeah absolutely. Which, you know, according to the police chief, James Fenwick, he said, quote, it is an area where Randy Taylor would have been familiar with and had access to close to an area where he used to live. So certainly this would have been in his comfort zone. I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use Jim Clemente's profiling language here. Comfort zone. Yeah, this is this is certainly a place where uh, they found it necessary to search not once, uh, but twice, you know, hoping to find both Samantha and Alexis and to this point sadly they have not they've also searched a body of water called the green county lake on more than one occasion i remember seeing divers on the news during this time frame who were searching for samantha's remains by the way i shouldn't uh, mention 
Orange, again, without also mentioning that there was an, an additional disappearance in the town of Orange, a young woman named Anne McDowell, A-N-N-E, McDaniel, excuse me, disappeared in 1996 from Orange and has never been found. Admittedly, these cases are 14 years apart, but I find it very striking that two young women would go missing from the same relatively small rural town 14 years apart. Again, I'm not a big believer in coincidence, and this doesn't strike me as one either. It seems like somebody's hunting grounds. If you want to get as as dramatic as that, it really does sound like this is a place where someone is comfortable, you know, finding young women that he can kidnap and murder and then dispose of their bodies in a way that is so thorough that no one has no one has located them yet. Sadly, uh, Samantha Clark's remains have never been found, of course, and Randy Taylor's attorney did admit in interviews that his client knew where Alexis Murphy's body could be found. But as we talked about a moment ago, there doesn't seem to be any reason for Randy Taylor to, to provide information to law enforcement about where these young women's remains can be found. It's occurred to me that about the only place where there might be some additional leverage might be a a situation like moving Taylor from one facility to another. Uh, My understanding is he has a son who would probably be in his early 20s now. This is from recollection. And so, for example, if there was a, a threat to move him to another location, which might be more difficult for Taylor to see his remaining family, I think whatever points of leverage his warden might have to discuss, you know, we're thinking about moving you to East Timbuktu Uh, supermax prison you know put that out there and see what happens because i i think the moral issues or and arguments to conscience or heart i think those things are probably absent in a in a person like randy taylor i've never never met this guy but i i think you'd have to just figure out what does this guy want no i i agree with you absolutely uh and it is it is just too bad that he has decided to selfishly take away any sense of... Now, I I know we've talked about the use of the term closure, um, but that's really the only thing that feels appropriate right here. It it is too bad that he is unwilling to give these families a sense of closure by revealing the location of Alexis, and if he is responsible for Samantha, her body as well. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Sources used for this week's episode of Mind Over Murder include reporting from ABC 13 News, CBS News, The Collegiate Times, The Fredericksburg Star, Medium.com, NBC News, The New York Daily News, The Richmond Times Dispatch, The Daily Progress, The Hook, The News in Advance. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.